let's uh, begin today we have a large portion to cover uh, we had covered we had three classes before this right so the first time we did an positioning of chronicles how to understand the book of chronicles then we did chapter second lesson we did chapter 1 to 4 and then the third lesson i had intended to cover what we are covering today also but uh, it was supposed to be a shorter session so we just said to do just chapter 5 because there's a lot in chapter 5 that we could learn today we'll cover from 6 all the way to 10 okay so a large chunk i'm hoping some of you or all of you at least would have got a chance to read it like i wrote in the message it's chronicles is not does not lend itself to easy reading it's pretty heavy reading right so we need to actually figure out a way to read through this to get to hold our interest and also to actually try to get something from this portion of scripture so let's dig into this because what i have found while preparing is that however initial the first reading of any portion any chapter however difficult it looks and however boring if i may use the word sometimes there's always some gems there if you can actually put yourself in the shoes of the listener and also look for the lessons that you can take out not just from the listener's perspective but from yours there's always something there there's always something and that's the beauty of the scripture and the amazing consistency that we see though something looks like dated far beyond many many thousands hundreds of years back it still is relevant and has meaning for us and that we will see as we dig into today's portion also so before we get into chapter six to uh, before we get into chapter six to ten, let's take a look at a quick overview of one to five. Okay, so chapter one to three, uh, we know that one to nine, all the way to nine, is all about genealogies, right? And we saw how for the Israelites, this is presented and written to the Israelites at the time that they are coming back from the Babylonian captivity. So they went into captivity where they had an identity as a nation, God's chosen person, people, a, a people with a covenant with the Lord, and yet they were taken away into captivity. And when they came back, they're just a remnant, a few people, and they're coming back to Jerusalem their city, David's city, which is now in ruins, and the temple is in ruins, and that's the context they're coming back. It's a new generation. Just like that generation that first entered the promised land, this is a new generation, right? And the first generation that entered the promised land had expectations, and they were going in there on a promise, and the second generation is coming back with a hope and an identity crisis, wondering, what is it? why when we come back they are confused about this identity they have heard a lot they have read the scriptures and but still are we this chosen people there are a lot of questions in their mind that's in that context that uh, this this chronicles portion is to be read so the first three chapters lays out how god makes his choice of a person abraham and then from him a, a people right and uh, why the israelites are a chosen race and also why david is god's chosen king and why he's his family why david's lineage is going to be the forever king right and then in chapter 4 we from there on there's a focus on the 12 tribes of israel right so this is number 12 though it's some tribes are missing and some new tribes are added if i may use the word new tribes so there is chapter 4 to 9 is a narrative of the various lists and families in the various tribes chapter 4 focuses on the tribe of judah and simeon very briefly in judah we see that there is this person the one standout person from whom we took some lessons and for whom Israel had some lessons was Jabez. In chapter four, verse, um, verse nine and 10, we saw Jabez's prayer, right? Jabez's prayer was, we were told that he called out to the God of Israel, if only you would bless me greatly, greatly bless me and expand my territory. May your hand be with me, keep me from harm so that I may not endure pain. 
and we are told God answered his prayer. We know very little about Jabez, except that his name meant that he was a person who caused pain. And we, had, we don't know much about his father. We don't know much about his mother. We do not know much about his children. Very little is known about him. But the scripture chooses to capture his prayer. So there are some lessons in that prayer for us. And three lessons we looked at in that lesson when we went through that chapter. One is from Jabez's prayer, we know that God, he recognized God as the source of all blessings. right? And then his prayer was a prayer asking for a fulfillment of his life's purpose, right? And he knew that prayer could actually help him fulfill his life's purpose as God destined it for him, as God wanted it for him. And this is despite what others think and expect of you. Remember his name given? And probably that's how he was known as a person who caused, was a cause for pain. Yet he knew that his life had a purpose in God's sight and through prayer, God would uh, help him fulfill that purpose. And then this crisis that he was born, the identity crisis that he had because of his name and because uh, the, of his circumstances, we know that his prayer helped him overcome his identity crisis. His life was fulfilled. His life's purpose was that he served because we, told, we are told that God answered his prayers. And this prayer is captured because there's a lesson in that for Israel too this remnant that came back. It was a reminder to them that God was a source of all blessings. God had a purpose for their lives and God would fulfill. If they prayed to the Lord, their life's purpose would be fulfilled. And if they were wondering about their identity, God would resolve the identity crisis. Okay, moving on to chapter five, which was the last chapter we did. Uh, we looked at the genealogy of the Transjordan tribes, the tribes of Reuben, Gada, Gad, and Manasseh. And from Reuben, we had a little bit of a background of Reuben. We knew that though he was the firstborn, with which came several privileges, traditional privileges, he had forfeited those privileges because of his sin, right? And from that, we learned that it is impossible to achieve salvation by works. So we saw a lot of Reuben's characteristics that he was a good guy amongst his brothers compared to his brothers. He did a lot of good stuff, right? He tried to save Joseph. He tried to, uh, how he tried to comfort his father. All of that painted a picture of Reuben being a good person at heart. But yet we know that he was passed over in his birthright. So, and God chooses somebody else to take that privilege. So from that, we know that salvation in the Lord's eyes is not something that you claim by birthright, right? It's not by your works, but it is through the absence of sin, right? It's a gift of grace granted through the blood and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we read the whole scripture, we can add what we learn from the New Testament to what we learn from the Old, as far as Reuben goes. And the second thing we learned is, though Reuben sinned, he was not cut off from God's love. He's still listed. His tribe is listed. And from that, we learned that even in our sinfulness, God's love covers a multitude of sin. And it's out of this love, this great love, that God has achieved the salvation for us because he loves us. right? And then we looked at the Transjordan tribe. So the tribes that settled on the other side of the Jordan, how when they were in trouble in one of their battles, how they called to the Lord and the Lord to help them prevail over a larger force. And yet they were the first to be carried away when the uh, Assyrian king actually invaded, right? When he came uh, down from Assyria towards the, he, how he took them away, right? So from that, we learned that we saw also, we reflected on how they settled on the side, the Transjordan side, on the Moabite plain, the other side of the Jordan, and did not enter the promised land. It was a choice they made because of what they saw with their eyes. They saw a good land, and it seemed to align well with what they felt was their profession. They had a lot of cattle. They said this is a rich, fertile place, and they chose to stay there. Because they chose to stay there, we saw how they got mixed among the tribes that lived there, and slowly they drifted away from the Lord. And then they were, when the Assyrian king came, they were carried away, right? So we know that from them, we learned that when you are a chosen tribe, when you are Israel, when you are, a, you are separated by God, you are chosen and separated by God for God's purpose. So 
and when you are separated for god's purpose if you however choose to settle and abide where god has not planned for you you will become a subject to temptation sin and its consequences right and we saw how god blesses obedience and punishes disobedience right so these are some of the takeaway lessons we had in the first five chapters moving into chapter 6 chapter 6 chose there's a focus on levi the tribe of levi it's one of the largest chapters there's about 81 verses there and a lot of detail on the tribe of levi and for the first time we see there's a focus on roles specific roles given to different uh, people in the tribe of levi right and we know levi's roles were as worship leaders they were priests they had the responsibility for taking care of the tabernacle they were musicians so everything associated with the worship of the lord they were chosen worship leaders and we see in verse 31 of chapter 6 david abides by god's choice and regulations because he says okay god has chosen the levites as my worship leaders and so when he appoints people as musicians and uh, responsibilities for the tabernacle he abides by god's choice and regulations when god chose Le- levi david does not choose somebody else for that same role and position instead he picks the levites for those god uh, chosen uh, responsibilities okay however it is not always like that if you remember from numbers when we studied numbers you would remember that it's in numbers 3 chapter 3 that the levites get chosen as the tribe from which god would pick the uh, people to lead his worship right so numbers 3 verse 12 says look i myself have taken the levites from among the israelites instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the israelites so the levites belong to me because all the firstborn are, are mine so what is what is the significance of this if you read exodus 13:2 we will see that when the lord led them out of egypt israel out of egypt he had ordered that the firstborn of israel is consecrated in fact he called israel his firstborn child and he says of the israelite in every family the firstborn was supposed to be consecrated to the lord it was the responsibility of the firstborn to be the worship leader in the family right and we see how in the desert how they abandoned that role and how they were unfaithful and that is when the lord chooses he actually again we see similar to reuben story right he bypasses that birthright that he gave them the first born's privileges and he chooses the levites instead so when the lord has a purpose he assigns he chooses people gives them a role but when you're unfaithful he can actually bypass you and actually pick somebody else so when we take that when you reflect on that how we see that repetition of the story that same theme between reuben and between and among the levites when the levites are chosen to be worship leaders i'm not going to the details of all the names of who are in charge of the tabernacle and the musicians etc but just reflecting on what we can take out from that okay so when we look at these two stories very similar reuben's uh first born privileges how it is bypassed and the first born of every family of israel how it gets bypassed and the levites get chosen instead and in reuben's case joseph's sons get and judah gets chosen right we saw how the leadership goes to judah and the privileges of inheritance went to joseph's sons in reuben's case right and in the first born of every israel family the privilege goes to the levites so what can we learn similarly each and every one of us is interested with roles and responsibilities so there's a lesson for israel also here right you all have roles and responsibilities what can you learn about the roles and responsibilities that you are interested with in the lord's plan that's a first question for us to reflect on Just uh, two things again. I haven't read uh, the whole portion. I said, but the uh, first part when I look at it, I think there are two parts. One is uh, understanding your role and responsibility. Right. Uh, essentially, in this case, they were assigned. In today's age, um, you know, how do we understand our individual roles and responsibilities? And the second one that I feel uh, was um, um, it was worth observation is that most roles were shared among men. It was not, uh, you know, worship leaders or 
even um, uh, the tabernacle responsibility was a, it was always plural group of men who were uh, responsibilities for it so uh, it uh, points to uh, you know one while there is an individual calling um, the responsibilities are shared uh, with each other as well so it's uh, it's unlikely that very unlikely i don't know uh, that you would have a role that is it that is uniquely for you in conflict with other people so there is a cohesion also uh, between what uh, in each individual's roles and responsibilities also i thought it was interesting that uh, you know there was no uh, one person in charge of the tabernacle or one person in charge of the worship and so forth there were always a group of people so yeah uh, while we celebrate a lot of individual leaders today you know especially in uh, you know in the in the reform churches it's essentially more about uh, at least in the patterns of the old testament it was around a group of men who had uh, uh, responsibilities and roles that were assigned uh, those are two observations i just made yeah actually that's a very nice observation i never thought in that perspective that's that's an eye opener so just some of the points that i had captured um, so really thank you sujit for that extra what you brought to the table so one is that god makes a sovereign choices is one thing uh, that i was thinking very often we tend to think that uh, where we are and what we are doing is all because of we made it and we forget that god's hand is there behind it sometimes so and i don't know sometimes whether we struggle with what we are doing is it a struggle that's coming out of a conflict with what you're supposed to be doing is is something that i just think about quite often and second like ruben lost the privileges of the first born your privileges and role can be forfeit when you're unfaithful to your calling so don't take we cannot take our role and responsibilities uh, for granted right Uh, there is no birthright to it and there's no we cannot claim it even in the secular world we will see that right and spiritually it's far more true very very true right and the, the other thing was like even when we fail right we are never cut off from god's love just like how we learned about ruben and even israel right though their first born and levites uh actually replace them even when we talk about the levites even even among the levites there was a rebellion kora had led that rebellion against aaron remember aaron's staff budding staff story yet we know that even for these people who are coming back the returnees they read the psalms right the psalms were written they were they knew the psalms and a lot of the psalms were composed by the same worship leaders that david had chosen kora's family they were written by the sons of kora right so even in your sin you're not cut off from god's love and god will use you right and he will redeem you and use you when we move to chapter 7 and 8 it covers the remaining tribes right so chapter 7 lists a whole set of tribes there's a brief mention of benjamin and benjamin again is refocused on in chapter 8 two omissions that stand out are the tribe of dan and zebulun i couldn't find a concrete reason why they were omitted and we have discussed this before but there are some reasons why 12 tribes are listed but not excluding dan and zebulun one is 12 is a number of completeness throughout chronicles we will see a reference to all israel all israel that the nation is intact the message is to all of israel and number the 12 is a number of completeness because of we see that among the 12 disciples we see that the 12 uh, sons of jacob the 12 tribes so that's probably why when he chose 12 left out dan and zebulun the chronicler possibly one reason and uh, the second could be among the returnees it's largely certain number of tribes that return right and probably the people uh, for from the tribe of dan and zebulun the representation might have very might have had a very low representation that could be the other reason why the chronicler chooses to omit these two right and then we know that some of the northern tribes 
were captured and exiled long before the Babylonian captivity of the southern tribes, right? The southern tribes are Judah and Benjamin largely. And so some of these tribes that are listed are not actually among the returnees. In chapter eight, we will look at some of the returnees being listed. So some of the tribes that are listed in seven are not among the returnees, but they're still included. So it's like a remainder, it's a future hope. They are exiled, they're scattered, but they're not forgotten. And their scatteredness, their dispersion is not permanent. So it holds out a future hope that in the future, in the Lord, in, in, in the last days, everyone would be reunited, right? So God would see his whole family coming together again. The definition of this Israel, that chosen race and the family might change, but there is a there is a not forgotten though you're scattered kind of a message here. Remembering that the Chronicles are specifically written to these people, right? To some people who come back. So there's a question here that I, I was thinking about. The tribe of Benjamin is listed twice, right? Once briefly in chapter seven and in great detail in chapter eight. Why? Why focus on Benjamin twice? Any thoughts? Anyway, so there's some things that I could I could get while studying about why there's a focus on Benjamin. One is clearly Benjamin produced Israel's first king, right? So like the family of uh, the Davidic lineage was captured in detail in chapter three, it's a stylistic thing also in the way uh, the biblical authors wrote. There is a structure, this, uh, there is a structure that they use which is like a inverted V, if you may call it. I think it's called a chiastic structure. So it's like chapter three focuses. When you look at the chapters that are used for the lineage, chapter three focuses on David and chapter eight focuses on Saul. And then you will see chapter four and five focus on the tribes, chapter seven and eight, uh, six and seven focus, seven and eight, I think focus on the other tribes and chapter six on the Levites, right? So there's a structure to that. And normally when the when scripture is written that way, there's kind of like, a, there's a mess, there's, there's in the structure also, there is some uh, relevance, like how the king's families, the two kings are important and the Levites are important, right? So that apex is the Levites, um, the, 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 fam, the tribe that leads in the worship and then David's family, because there's a, big role in God's plan for the king and for the priest, right? Second is David's city of Jerusalem was part of the tribal allocation of Benjamin. So that's the place that God had chosen as the place where his temple is to be built, right? Gibeon was Saul's favorite city and that's where the tabernacle stood until David moves into Jerusalem. So the second reason is also because of Jerusalem, right? And so these are the very important things for the returnees, right? Their identity is getting framed for, formed around this, the importance of Jerusalem. And Benjamin's tribe, the tribe of Benjamin is the only tribe that joins Judah in the Southern Kingdom, and they remain kind of loyal to the Davidic dynasty. So these are some of the reasons why there's a focus on the tribe of Benjamin, a larger focus along with the tribe of Judah and Levi, rather than the other tribes, which are all mentioned very briefly. Right. So one thing to note is like I was pointing out, right, when chapter one to eight, the three tribes that have initially it is the tribe of Judah and David's family, then the tribe of Benjamin and Saul's family, and then Levi's family. Right. If you take that as a V shape, so we can, it's a message to the returnees that they can point to their ancestry from the first king and the and David God's forever king and Levites would be their worship leaders. Moving to chapter nine, okay? Chapter nine lists, um, it starts with the returnees, a brief description of the returnees. And it's a very significant first three verses. The first three verses reads as, so all Israel were, was recorded in genealogies and these were written in the book of the kings of Israel. And Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith. Now the first to dwell again in their possessions, in their cities were Israel, the priests and the others who came back, okay? So if you look at this, chapter nine is a bridge between the genealogies up to chapter eight and then the narrative, historic narrative 
in from chapter 9 10 onwards okay so chapter 8 gives you why you are chosen and chapter 9 onwards talks about why you went into exile and this verse bridges the three so if you just i just colored it differently you will see that the first statement is reflects on chapter 1 to 8 you were chosen for a purpose the second phrase in that in this 1 to 3 talks about the breach of faith you went into exile because of a breach of faith and the last talks about god's grace however abounds that's why you have returned to your city right so we we'll see this is a pattern right that kind of repeats itself in scripture and in israel's history chosen for a purpose breach of faith and but god's grace still abounds and through that god's purpose always sees its fulfillment right so verses 3 to 34 and that's that's a very interesting pattern it's uh, just just that pattern i wanted to call out okay in chapter 9 verses 3 to 34 we see that there's a great focus on among the returning people key roles and responsibilities i just picked on some of the words the phrases that keep repeating themselves the phrases that repeat in this portion which talks about some of the important roles and responsibilities for those recipients of grace who have been brought back to Jerusalem. One is they had to be leaders of families. Second, the service, importance in the service in God's temple. They had to be gatekeepers and guards of faith of the tabernacle, which was the, the, the focus of their faith. They had to be caretakers of the temple. They had to be worship leaders. They had to be priests. So do they all live by this alone? They had their other jobs to do. They probably had to take care of their cattle, their fields, and all of that. But these are the key things that are called out, right? So we see that of these roles, some are full-time responsibilities. We clearly see when you read that portion, you'll see some of them had to stay in the tabernacle. They had to be there full-time, the worship leaders, the priests, the caretakers. Some of them had full-time accountability, right? They were all-time roles. You had other things to do, but still you had accountability. It was an all-time responsibility and it, they were non-negotiable, like leaders of your family, guards and caretakers of faith, all of these, okay? So those, the, the, the description of the roles and responsibilities, this is something that we can take out from that, even for us, right? Some of us are interested with full-time responsibilities as far as our faith lives goes, as worship in, in, in the kingdom of God. And some have all-time responsibilities, not full-time, but it's all-time and non-negotiable, and you're accountable for that. Caretakers of faith, leaders of your family are some of them that can be called out that way. Chapter 10 is a focus on Saul. Very short chapter, right? We When we read Samuel, we see that there are many chapters that describe Saul's kingship, the mistakes he makes, and how he pounds David, and all of that, right? But Chronicles chooses a short chapter to focus on Saul. And this chapter 10 focuses only on the last chapter of Saul's life. So why? It's a reminder to Israel that do not cease to attempt to seize the initiative from God. Who was Saul? He was a king and he represented Israel's choice because they wanted a king like the nations around them, right? They could not wait for God's choice. So it's, it was a reminder to them, your choice of king, when you seize the initiative rather than following God and waiting on him faithfully, all that is remembered is that last chapter of this life. And what are some of the key lessons, key call out in this chapter on Saul's life? One, the fact that the Philistines had killed Saul and placed his armor in their temple and hung his head on the temple of Dagon. And second, we are told that Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord and did not obey his instructions, right? He did not seek the Lord's guidance, so the Lord killed him and transferred the kingdom to David, son of Jesse. So we know that 10 onwards in Chronicles is a narrative portion. When you go back to that previous thing, 
see this red ocean and Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith. In chapter 10 onwards, we'll be told what is this breach of faith, the reason why they were taken into exile, like we did in the first portion. And, and very briefly in the last portion of Second Chronicles, we are told they're brought back, right? So chapter 10 onwards is going to tell you what is this breach of faith that results in their exile. And chapter, it starts with Saul, the lesson for them starts with Saul. And it's just a very brief thing. It just says that Saul was your choice. He did not seek the Lord's guidance. So the Lord took him out, right, and transferred the kingdom to David. So from now on, we will see how in the remaining chapters, how David performs, what were his mistakes, what were the things he did right, and what were the things he did wrong. Okay, so a lot of genealogies, no? So when I was just studying about this, I came across this verse, right, in 1 Timothy. This is Paul's advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Instruct certain people not to spread false teachings, not to, not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote useless speculation rather than God's redemptive plan that operates by faith. So just thinking, does this stand contradictory to what we are trying to learn from Chronicles and all the extensive genealogies that are captured in the scripture in the Old Testament and even the genealogies in, in, when, of Jesus that are captured in, uh, in the New Testament? So how to understand this portion? How do we align the lessons we got from First Chronicles to the lesson that Paul is trying, the advice that Paul has given to Timothy? You must place yourself in the context that Timothy is, in Paul's context, right? Think about Jesus. Whom were the people he had to deal with? Whom were the people he had to scorn for? So what could be the reason why Paul is advising Timothy that focusing on endless genealogies and along with that, he says, occupy yourself with myths and endless genealogies is not desirable, right? So think about this. Any thoughts? that you can, we all have, have uh, the New Testament is easier for us to recall, right? The Gospels and all of that. So what are your thoughts? What could Paul possibly be leading towards? Does it stand in contradiction to what we studied about in the first eight, nine chapters of First Chronicles? I think the context is different, I, th I thought, because Timothy, that time it's the church age. Mm -hmm. he, here in Old Testament, it's not yet the church age. So I, I think the context itself is church. So when we talk about false teachings, it might be about false teachers and false doctrines that are, I mean, that's still there today. Yeah. Um, but the context of Old Testament, it, the, it's not a church age. It's still the history of Israel, which is a theocratic context. Okay, yeah. So that's one way clearly how we can align the two and, um, and actually see that there is no contradiction. Any other thoughts? Actually, to a certain extent, I was thinking that what Paul had to say actually re-emphasizes what we have learned so far in many ways, if you think about it. It's not contradicting. It, in fact, re-emphasizes because what Paul is saying is, remember the pharisaical kind of an approach to faith, right? Blind observance of the laws, rituals. The, the, the essence is gone. The faith part is gone. It's like living in a mythical world and not in the kingdom of God. So the whole reason for the genealogy in Chronicles is to tell Israel that you're redeemed and restored for a purpose and for God's purpose. But when you just call on that as an entitlement and convert the law into a set of rituals, it becomes a myth. You're living in a mythical world. So actually, if you look at it that way, it is an emphasis. He's emphasizing a lot of the essence of what we studied. Second is, it's not by birth or position, but by faith, right? 
your privileges can be forfeited like we learned when you're unfaithful to your calling. It is your faith and faithfulness that counts. And it's a reminder, like Paul was actually advising Timothy, he was reminding them it's all about God's plan for redemption and restoration by faith, right? You're not cut off because of your sin. It's so not by birth, not but by faith. And it's all about God's plan. So I think if you actually look at Paul's so one, there is an emphasis of the essence of what Chronicles had, the message that it had for Israel also. So just want to conclude with that. And uh, that's, that's it for today's lesson.